Hey guys, it's Melanie. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to do day six of my Once Upon a Book Club Advent Box. So stay tuned. So if this is the first one of these videos that you've clicked on, I definitely recommend you go back and check out the rest of the unboxings for this, uh, starting with the day one. This box actually came with this full book here. It's 12 short stories. It's 12 days of book club -mas. And each story has its own gift to open. So this is the day six story, which is Before It Snows by Jenny L. Smith. And then when we get to the spot in the story where we're supposed to open our gift, I will stop and open the gift and show it to you and then we'll continue the story. So let's get started. The warmest coat fell perfectly around Mac's shoulders along with 10 pounds of guilt. The feeling emerged slowly, barely a snail's pace when she first slipped on the woolly beauty earlier this morning. It was the kind of coat that hugged her arms and flattered her waist, and best of all, didn't make her look like a skiing marshmallow. The problem was, it wasn't hers. She spotted it all the way on the other side of the shared closet in the very back, a tangle of hangers taking the tan coat prisoner. Kara's side of the closet was like the wet, Wild West. There were no rules or organization, just a bunch of clothes jammed in every which way. Mac had to shimmy the coat out in slow tugs back and forth until it fell free into her hands. The buttons were a marvel, big and bold circles that were slightly transparent when the light hit right. Then there was the fleece lining around the collar, a soft built-in cloud that sealed Mac's decision with one touch. If only her mind could turn off and forget the coat's origin, or the last time she sneaked out with her sister's clothes on her back. The spilled tea all down the borrowed linen blouse. Now, standing out in the cold, she felt her body draw in, arms, shoulders, chin, trying to conceal the coat and her growing guilt that would soon be the size of an elephant. She pulled at the long blue scarf that she had wrapped around her neck four times. It was more scarf than she would ever need in regular circumstances, but it managed to cover the collar and two buttons. She just couldn't move her neck very well. You know, Kara, when I asked you to take me to town, I meant by car. Her older sister didn't look up to Mac's good fortune. Her attention seemed to be consumed by the bare sidewalk as they walked. I don't like to give rides, Kara said, her words muffled by her own scarf. But what, you'll lead chaperoned walks? It's what they did in the olden days, Mac's nose scrunched together. Yeah, well, they also only took baths once a month. Mac thought Kara would drop her off at town by car, as she usually did, a one-minute drive. More than likely, between her ridiculous scarf and the seatbelt, her sister would have never noticed the unofficially borrowed coat. What Mac did not foresee was that her sister would want to walk in the 27-degree weather with her instead. Mac studied her unusually quiet sister, not exactly sure who was walking beside her. Of course, Carr looked the same. Wavy chestnut hair that fell past her shoulders, vintage red coat that smelled like someone's great aunt, and nails that were always polished, recent, recently navy blue. They shared the same pale green eyes, but lately that seemed to be all the sisters shared, excluding their parents and their room. Mac couldn't quite pinpoint when the change between them occurred. She could just tell, sort of like when she broke her arm in the fifth grade, some things were plain intuitive. Why didn't you want to drive? Kara's head lifted, her eyes looking past Max as she pushed back her hair. I already told you. You do know what frostbite is, right? It's not that cold out. It's actually kind of nice. Mac huffed, pulling at the tote around her shoulder and wondering if any of the side effects of frostbite included delusion. Their step fell in a rhythm, red sneakers and brown suede boots moving swiftly up the center of their sleepy town. They were on the edge of winter, the cold just beginning, and Mac's body had yet to adjust. Her face stung from the frigid air that had swallowed Ohio overnight, her hands taking refuge in the deep pockets of the coat. The sky had turned a moody gray, and she could feel the shift all around her. It was a quiet coldness, a stillness that meant one inevitable thing. Snow was coming. It was also the very reason why Mac needed to get to town today. If it was going to snow for the next two months, then she needed books by the armful. Kara didn't go into the library with her. She may have been an unrecognizable robot, but she was still her sister. 
She disappeared into a small shop right before the library. The familiar green canopy hanging above the red door jingling as Kara was sucked in. Mac would have to retrieve her later. The library was empty and warm when she entered. Mac unwound her scarf a couple of times, freeing her neck as she walked over to the wide front desk. She exchanged her knee-high stack of books for a brand new pile she had on hold. A burst of excitement pulsed through her as her fingers gripped the stack. Adventures wrapped in paperback and hardcover spines, pages and pages full. She already imagined her afternoon. Blanket draped around her, mug with a hot something, maybe lavender tea or no, hot cocoa, extra, extra creamy. And a book propped up on her knees, her own indoor haven as the snow fell on the outside world. Matt carefully placed each book in her tote. The purple flower keychain around the handle swayed, the decorative plastic petals reminding her that winter wasn't forever. She put the layers of scarf back around her neck. She was more than ready to go home now. There was one barrier, though, blocking her path, and Mac was currently staring it down. A deep sigh left her lips as her eyes latched onto the open sign that hung from the red door. The neighboring glass window was frosted, distorting the view, but she already knew what was inside. Don't go in, she told herself. Carol will come out. But waiting was not Mac's specialty. Even with the warm coat wrapped around her, the cold was seeping through. Her thin, uninsulated red sneakers quickly becoming a regret. Her hands reached for the door, the jingle of the bells singing to her, room, her doom. The smell of old hit her nostrils instantly as Mac stepped into another era. Stuff was everywhere. There were no aisles, just a narrow opening that led her into a wandering maze of junk. Wooden coat racks that stood like trees, old black and white photos of someone else's relatives, end tables stacked on more end tables. And there on the far left past the creepy dolls was Kara, hunched over, gawking at something. Oh my goodness, Mac, look at this! Kara was already lifting the heavy oval up before Mac could object. No, Mac, you're not even looking at it. Don't need to. We have five mirrors in our room. Five. Granted, only two were mounted on their walls. The other three were resting against the corner, waiting for Kara to clean them up. She was always saving old stuff. She called it upcycling, restoration, being environmentally responsible, yada yada. But what began as an admirable hobby had turned their shared room into a claustrophobic attic. Except instead of being full of family treasures and junk, it was full of strangers' treasures and junk. Primarily the latter. Kara put the mirror back down, moving farther down the trail of clutter. Are you about done? The question slipped out pointed and prickly. Not yet. Kara seemed to have regained a little more vibrance to her, her face brightening at every old thing she found in this place. Her hands waved along the words she spoke, trying to explain to Mac how to identify the decade of vintage mirror, just what Mac wanted to know. A ribbon around Kara's wrist peeked out from under her coat sleeve, a satin teal that had a slight sheen to it. Kara had tied it into a loose bow that hung at the base of her wrist. She said it was like the vintage bracelets that women used to wear in the olden days, but all Max saw was a ribbon tied to an arm. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Kara let out a small squeal, her hands clasping together as she looked down at a table. What? Mackenzie Rose, may I introduce you to the newest addition to our room? Kara scooped up a weathered piece of wood as long as her arm. The lines of age marked the lightweight board, a deep crack trailing down to the side. The wood itself had faded into a dullish gray that reminded Mac of today's sky. No. Here's the thing. I can do so much with it. I can turn it into a key rack or make a rustic sign with stenciled letters. You're just going to add it to the pile and it will sit there forever as a piece of wood. Forever and ever. You don't know that and besides, it doesn't matter. You already used up your veto powder power today. Kara brushed past her and made a beeline to the cash register. The lone worker was sitting in the very back of the antique shop, an older man who barely looked up from the newspaper when they approached. Kara plopped the piece of wood down in front of him, grinning so big that Mac thought her face might split open. After she paid, they headed back out into the cold. As they crossed the street, Mac's shoulder began to ache, a dull tiredness that was coming from her tote and all the books inside. Hold a sec. They both stopped on the edge of the sidewalk as Mac removed the white tote from her shoulder, the beautiful black letters catching her eye. The looping words flowed off the fabric, an endless story that Mac was always writing in her head. It was a gift from her parents for all the book runs and errands Mac did by foot. 
She placed the tote on the sidewalk, pulling at the zipper that hugged the center of the bag. The tote suddenly expanded, doubling in size as she pulled up the handles. She slipped out the wheels on the bottom of her tote, now a handy rolling bag. Beautiful magic, she thought. Can you put this in there too? Kara extended the old piece of wood to her. Mac stared. Please, Mac, it's not heavy. I just don't want to lug it the whole way. Her stubbornness was kicking in, her mouth ready to split, spit out some jab about how Kara should have driven, but then Mac remembered the whole picture. Smuggled coat around her shoulders. All right. They lived in the part of town where the gaps between houses were wide and the roads narrow. Their own street was tucked behind a thicket of trees with long stretching limbs. They leaned over the road as they were waving high to the cars that passed. When Mac was younger, she imagined those trees could talk, just like from a book she once read. She wondered what they would say today, their branches bare and their trunks muted from color, from winter's dull palette. She bet they were cold, too. Their friends from school always joked that the two sisters lived on a farm. In truth, they lived across from a farm, at least what used to be a farm. The old farmhouse was perched on a hill, a small barn behind it. The perimeter was marked with yards of posts and wire, remnants of where a herd of cows once resided. Now it was an empty space of land. Mac wasn't even sure who lived there anymore, but she was pretty certain someone still did. Every now and then, she could see a light at night illuminating from the hill. As they walked along the fence line, Mac noticed the plain mailbox standing out by the driveway, now twisted into a new shape. The lid was completely dented in, the whole structure leaning dramatically to the one side. The post was unscathed for the most part, the top slightly splintered. Whoa, that box is having a bad day. Kara didn't say anything, she just bobbed her head. Five giant steps across the street and Mac could see their house. Mac pulled her bag with a little more gusto. Heat was just a driveway and a key away. She would put on her slippers, make some hot cocoa, maybe two cups, and she'd lay her blanket and blanket on her until she was wrapped in a warm cocoon with her books. Ah. Mac yelped, her body jumping back so quickly her stomach lurched. At some point, she must have pulled Kara along with her because her hand was grasping her sister's. Kara yanked it away, pulling her disheveled hair from her eyes and mouth. Jeez, Mac, what's wrong with you? But Mac could not explain herself now. A small goat was currently staring her down. The brown and white barnyard wonder had a beard that rivaled their Uncle Bo's with the ambitions of a mountain climber. He was standing on the top of their old picnic table, his little tail wiggling back and forth, his hooves firmly planted until Kara took a step forward. Then his legs started to shuffle. It's a goat, Mac. I know that, she huffed, folding her arms against her chest. But it might as well have been a vicious coyote. Mac's chest tightened, her lungs compressing until her breath was a shallow, measly puff. She had a thing about animals, this gripping fear that made no sense. Petting zoos, animal shelters, wildlife sanctuaries. She was fine visiting. She enjoyed those places, actually. It was when any animal stepped out of his kennel or pen that her heart kicked her chest and her gut started to roll. Good gravy. She was afraid of a goat. To her dismay, the goat didn't stay on the table long. He hopped to the bench, then off to the ground, and like a dog, he came running to them. Hey, little guy. Kira stooped down and intercepted him. She rubbed his head repetitively as the animal let out a strangled cry. He sounds mad. He's bleeding, Mac. What? It's the sound that a goat makes. Mac's eyes shift to Kara. Why wasn't she disturbed by the surprise goat as much as Mac? Before Mac could stop the furry thing, he was approaching her. Oh no, 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 no. Her hands dived into her coat pockets, her legs taking another step back until she became as still as a statue. Maybe if she didn't move or breathe, and made a wish to the universe that the goat would magically go away. She closed her eyes. She opened them, slowly. Her limbs were intact, red shoes still there, her head lifted and turned. The goat was heading for her rolling bag. Not the books! Not the books! Fight or flight! Fight or flight! Mac propelled herself forward, suddenly a self-appointed guardian of the library, a protector of the words, the books in her bag, her only motivation from the grumbling fear pushing aside her ping-pong heart. She was valiant, she was brave, and she was way too slow. The goat was already gnawing on something around the handle of her bag before she and Kara could pull him back. He didn't exactly eat the plastic flower keychain, not quite. It was more like he enjoyed a piece of bubble gum, then spit the chewed wad back out. The six petals were now one blob of purple, somehow still hanging together. 
gross. I can't believe he ate it. Chewed, Kara corrected. Kara was technically right, but unhelpful. Well, he needs to go. Now. It was an obvious statement, yet she had no clue how to uninvite a goat. I know who he belongs to. Kara's hands were in her pockets, her head tipping down, avoiding Max's gaze. You do? Kara pointed to the old farmhouse across the street. We should get him back before it snows. And how do we do that? Kara shrugged. I'll carry him. You? He's barely two feet tall. I can handle him. Her sister, tennis player extraordinaire, may have been naturally athletic and determined, but Mac had her doubts if Kara's athletic ability would transfer seamlessly into goat herding. It didn't. Nope. Nope. Kara's arms let go of the squirming goat as she flung back to the ground. Her breath seemed to be caught in her throat as she lay on the brown frozen grass, elbows against knees. Finally, she sighed. He's heavier than he looks. Mac extended one arm to Kara, her legs rising up from the ground until she was standing fully upright on her feet. Okay, here's the thing. We're just going to have to walk him across the street. Walk him? It's either that or put him in the car and drive him. Sure, Mac thought. She'll give the goat a ride, but not her own sister. But the more Mac pondered this idea, the more the thought turned into a growing nightmare. Trapped in a small space with hooves and teeth and plenty of things for him to chew on, including her arm. Walking it is! Neither of them knew exactly how to walk a goat. They had theories. Kara claimed if they started walking, he'd follow. Her theory failed. The little goat just wagged his tail, throwing out more bleats as if he was laughing at them. Mac's idea involved a leash and a collar, but they didn't have a leash or a collar. They never had a dog. The goat was edging toward Mac again. She quickly grabbed her bag and darted a few feet to the side. She jumped on the picnic table if necessary. Wait, I think he likes your bag. Kara was grinning. A thought illuminating her face causing Mac to frown instantly. He just wants to chew it up some more. No, I think he likes the sound of it moving. Try it again. Mac scrunched her nose, but after a second or two, she pulled the handles as the bag rolled against the paved driveway. Sure enough, the goat followed. Well, I don't like him following behind me. It's creepy. Just keep moving. You'll be fine. Mac once read a book about a group of men in the early days braving the uncharted sea for a necessary mission. They didn't know what obstacles were in front of them when they left, and that was her now, setting out across the street with a hungry goat following on her heels. Good luck to them all. Her sneakers darted across her, their driveway to the paved road, hooves clomping right behind her. The street was deserted as usual, but she still refused to cross until she looked both ways. Safety first, even when there's a goat involved. Kara? Her sister was slightly behind her, her red coat and Max's eyeline. She could hear the taps of hooves circling her shadow. What? Do goats bite? They have teeth. That's your answer? Oh my gosh, Kara, you're supposed to tell me, no, Mac, they don't bite. You'll be perfectly fine leading a feral goat across the street. Am I supposed to participate in this conversation or are you going to keep talking to yourself? Keep talking to myself. I'm alone in this world. Mac sighed, pressing her teeth together as she pulled her bag even faster. At least you have a goat to keep you company. The driveway that led to the farmhouse had a gradual incline at first and then it transformed into a trek of a mountain. The goat did not seem bothered by this, but Mac had already walked a couple of miles today and her legs weren't happy. Her pace had slowed and pulling the bag no longer seemed easy. Here. Kara's hands gripped around the black handles, relieving Mac. You owe me five extra minutes at the antique shop next time. Can't wait. The farmhouse seemed different up close. It had an old-time quality to it. The white posts of the railing, the black shutters faded from the sun. Mac could see the years of living ingrained into the two-story structure, the yellow siding perhaps paler than it once was. The porch steps creaked as they went up them, the goat hopping up each one easily. He seemed to have transformed into a hyper child that had too much sugar, crying that awful sound and prancing on wooden floorboards like it was a stage. Mac's gut still felt uneasy about the whole situation, even though she hadn't been eaten alive yet. Maybe it was standing here on the front porch of someone they did not know, Kara pressing the doorbell, then waiting, and waiting. Mac did not know how Kara was certain this goat belonged to this house. Maybe she was rushing to snap judgments and assumptions. Just because it used to be a farm didn't mean it still was. So Mac, there's something I need to tell you. Mac heard nothing more. Kara's words were interrupted by a creaking door. Standing behind the half-open door was a short woman with short white hair wearing the loudest shade of orange. 
She stepped out onto the porch, her shoulders relaxed, her face creased in soft lines that extended from her eyes and around the corners of her mouth. The orange vest puffed out from her petite frame, her jeans speckled in dirt and paint. Well, sweet Dill, you found Elvis. The goat came charging over to the woman, jumping up to her knees, making that awful strangled sound again. She didn't scream like Mac did earlier or seem bothered by the animal's presence. In fact, she was grinning. This one's an escape artist, a real four-legged Houdini. Surprised he didn't get halfway to Texas. She patted his head and cooed something sweet to him, as if he wasn't a goat at all. The woman finally straightened her back, her eyes lifting to the pair as if she was noticing them for the first time. Where'd you find him, girls? Mac was standing off to the side of the porch near the steps. She had inadvertently shielded herself behind Kara, forcing her sister to speak. In our yard, on our picnic table. A picnic in winter? That's ambitious of you, Elvis. Surprise your hooves aren't frozen solid. Mac's eyes wandered to the woman's brown laced work boots and her weathered hands. The signs of work and grit pressed into her skin. She wondered if the woman took care of this place all by herself. Your sister's right. If I had ten dimes, I'd bet every single one. Mac blinked. Yes, we are, Kara said, smiling. The woman nodded. My sister and I look like distant relatives, the kind where you have to really squint to look and see an ounce of resemblance. She always had the good hair. I guess you know how that is. The woman was looking straight at Mac as she said the words. Wait, Mac thought. Is she saying I have the bad hair too? Or the good hair? Suddenly, Mac's neck jerked forward, a strong tug causing her to tilt down at the wooden floorboards. Stop that, Elvis! But the goat ignored his owner. A mouthful of blue knitted scarf clenched in between his teeth. If Mac hadn't wrapped the scarf around her neck a zillion times, she could have unwound herself easily. Now she was a helpless chew toy at the mercy of a goat. Mac's hands grabbed onto part of the scarf closest to her neck so she wouldn't be choked. Her fingers tightened around the fabric, tugging against the goat's incredibly strong re resistance. The woman and Kara were now by her side, trying to intervene. It was like a rubber band snapping, the resistance suddenly gone. She flung back two steps, her hands grabbing the porch railing for balance. The goat was in the woman's grasp, no longer chewing on her scarf, but it was the quiet clink of a round object on the floor that gained Mac's attention. A big, bold button. Oh no. She snatched up the button as quickly as she could, placing it in the center of her palm. She could feel Kara's eyes dance over the transparent circle as Mac's fingers closed around it. Sorry about that, dear. He has a weakness for clothes. Mac's shoulders slumped, her scarf now hanging open one end on each side of her. Kara's coat was in perfect view. They stood there in a few beats of silence. The conversation now stalled. Well, girls, I'm not getting any younger. I suppose I should get back in. Thanks for bringing this rascal home. Sure, do you want us to take Elvis to the barn for you? Kara seemed unwilling to part with the goat. Mac just wanted to sprint home, goat-free. That would be swell, Kara. The woman went back into the house as Kara and Elvis hopped down the stairs. Mac was motionless for a second. Are you coming, Mac? She had no choice but to follow. The snow had finally arrived, small white flakes slowly falling on them as they walked to the barn. The barn was plain and beige with a strip of land in between the structure and the farmhouse. Kara was walking briskly and so was the goat. It was as if he knew he was almost home. Kara? Her voice came out in a quiet muffle. Why are you whispering? Because we're at a stranger's house and you have a goat and I don't know. Frustration gripped Mac's voice. It was like she missed part of the story, her eyes glazing over a whole page, maybe an entire chapter. But then something turned in her brain, a spark of realization. How did she know your name? What? The goat lady. Kara stopped and sighed. The goat lady's name is Miss Arthur, and her sister's head turned from side to side. Okay, here's the thing. Kara played with the teal ribbon on her wrist, pushing it up, then back down. Did you see that mailbox out front? Mac remembered the splintered pole, the massive dent encompassing the box. The smashed one? Kara nodded. I kind of had a little mishap with the car. Mishap was a kind way of putting it, but Mac didn't point this out. When? A week ago. I didn't realize how close to the side I was. Anyways, I went and I told Miss Arthur immediately. She was nice enough not to report it. Actually, she said the mailbox was hideous anyways. Kara smiled, the corners of her mouth slightly lifting. It didn't feel right doing nothing, so I offered to help her for a couple of weekends around the barn. Did you know that she's a goat farmer? Mac shook her head. Five minutes ago, she didn't know Miss Arthur existed. She moved here a few months ago. Said she prefers a state with snow. 
She's actually really nice. Kara's words sunk into her brain, the whole day now making sense. Wait, is that why you won't drive me anymore? Kara shook her head. I mean, I didn't give up driving if that's what you're thinking. It would be a long winter if I did. For the both of them. It's just the car, it's... Kara's hands extended, her palms up as they waved her words into existence. The side mirror is sort of broken, and there might be a gash on the door. Might be? I haven't had the guts to look. I parked it in the garage and left it there. Mom and Dad haven't noticed? Not yet. Kara shrugged. I might have strategically parked it near the wall. Mac could have said so many things, like how Kara needed to tell her parents, and how Mac was the worst secret keeper of this century, and telling her first might be Kara's biggest mistake, more so than the car. But one thought was bigger than the rest. Kara? Yeah? Do you even know anything about goats? Well, I know any time I get near the barn, I have to suck in my breath so I don't gag, and that I've never smelled worse after any job before. Mac couldn't help it. Spurts of laughter shot up her throat. I'm glad you're okay. Mac gave Kara a small smile, one that she returned. Me too. Kara still had Mac's rolling bag. They both seemed to notice this fact at the same time, but Kara didn't hand it over. Instead, she yanked off the chewed up flower, tossing the keychain into the bag. Then she pushed up her coat sleeve and removed the teal ribbon from her wrist. Do you know one of the reasons I like vintage things? Because you're old? Ha, huh, no. And it says to open our gift. So let's find our gift for day six. It's this one right here. Okay, it looks like a, maybe a book sleeve or something like, or some kind of book tote. We have like a little wrist strap kind of thing. And there is a zipper here in the front. And it's just a little open pocket. And then a big zipper. That goes all the way around. Oh my gosh! Okay. Opening it up. Hold on. So when it opens up, it opens up like this. So you flip over this part here that's got the pocket and you zip it back. And then we have her cool tote that has wheels and a little kickstand. This is so cool! And it's got writing all over it. That is very, very cool. I like that a lot. Okay, let's continue our story. It says, Kara wrapped the ribbon around the handle, tugging it as she pulled the threads through the loop she created. The two strands hung free, the vibrant teal standing out in the dull winter landscape. They can always be remade, again and again. Kara extended the bag to Mac. Guilt now weighed heavy in her pocket, her fingers slipping inside and retrieving the contents. Um, here. Mac's fingers uncurled, the coat button coming back into view. Kara didn't say anything, though her eyes leaned into the button. She then picked it up. Thanks. They headed to the barn. It was bigger than Mac imagined, her height feeling small as she stood by the tall, wide doors. Kara pushed the one side open, the frigid air now mixing in with the smells of the country. Elvis nearly sprinted inside, a bunch of bleats and cries echoing against the barn walls. Apparently, his friends were happy to see him. Kara, I can't go in there. What, the smell? No. Mac shook her head, her chest tight again. Too many goats. A small smile wrapped around her sister, the space between them no longer so wide. She nodded as she began to walk through the barn door, her head leaning back. Oh, and Mac? Yeah? I want my coat back. And that's the end. Did you guys enjoy this story? I really did. I like, it was like a, there was a bit of a bookish element to it. I always like bookish books. And so it was cute, like all of the library stuff and I absolutely adore 
this bag. I think it is so very cool. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a big thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this, click that subscribe button down below. And until next time, remember to always be completely you. Bye!